Come, O come, Emmanuel, is the cry of our church for this season of Advent. We come here on the first Sunday of Advent, and I welcome you to Mount Tabor, United Methodist Church, as we as the worship team gather here in our sanctuary with our friends and you here on the internet. Thank you for joining with us on this Christmas celebration. As you can see, we are decorated. I thank Robin for taking the lead and putting a lot of work and getting our place decorated, and Ron and Linda doing the hard work of going up ladders and stuff like that. So uh, we celebrate. And this morning, I invite you, uh, if you have candles, have them before you as we, uh, as we, as Robin and Lily initiate with the light of our candle to start off our Advent season. We do have a good number of announcements, and that's normally true in our church during this time of Christmas. Remind you, during this uh, Advent season, we will continue to have our, our traditional services. On December 24th at 7 p.m., we will have a Christmas Eve service at 7 p.m. It will be live streamed, and uh, we will be here uh, for that service. And then December 13th, on Sunday, December 13th at 4 p.m., that's one of our Sundays, we're going to have our Blue Christmas. Now, normally, we would gather here uh, for those who are dealing with loss and just a difficulty during this season just to remember and celebrate and find hope in the midst of our grief. We will still do that uh, through the internet system, though, uh, on Facebook Live. And I know a lot of us may need that service during this season. Uh, poinsettia orders are out now in. We're pretty much ready to go, and I believe starting next Sunday, we'll, yeah. we'll start seeing our poinsettias out there during that coming Sundays. Um, this coming week, uh, December Thursday, December 3rd, I and, and Mike will be leading uh, in a blood drive. It's, our, it's not our quarterly blood drive, it's just extra. Uh, the Red Cross has asked us to do an extra one with the need for blood right now, but if you haven't had a chance to give a blood, you're welcome to come Thursday between 2 and 7 for the giving. During this season, we have not had a chance to really do a lot of fundraising for our Blessing and Backpack program. As you know, we've just not been able to do gathering. So one of the things that we have is on Tuesday is what is known Giving Tuesday throughout the United States. And Terry will be sending out a special link uh, for, if, for those who could want to give to the Blessing and Backpack program. And my understanding, if you give, if it's, I believe it's doubled or it has a special significance, but Terry will be giving and sending that out so that we can have a chance if you'd like to give to our Blessing and Backpack program. Uh, also today is Fifth Sunday. I, I did ahead and put on our Facebook page a link to the Kentucky Methodist Children's Home during this Sunday we normally give to our Methodist Children's Home and you're invited to do that. And finally, next Sunday is Communion Sunday. Now because we can't gather in our sanctuary, it's gonna be much more difficult. So what we're gonna do, if the weather permits, if weather permits, we're still going to consecrate the elements here during the service. And then from 11 to 1, after the service over, I'm going to have a table set upside outside in the parking lot so that if you would like to come and receive your elements, I'll be there. And so that way you can come from 11 to 1 to receive the communion elements. So go ahead and prepare yourself. You may need to get out of your pajamas next Sunday so that you're ready to go. And... Uh, so that you can jump in the car and after the service is ended, come on down here to Mount Tabor so that you can receive your elements of uh, bread and wine that has been consecrated during our service so that we can all participate in that time. Have I, have I left out any announcements? Reminder that if you go ahead and start placing on the comment field both your prayers and praises as we come to the time of prayer and concern, we'll be able to voice those. All right. Well, this is the season, a new year of the Christian calendar. And it begins with the birth and the celebration and the expectation of Jesus Christ's coming. So I invite everyone to take a deep breath as we prepare ourselves for worship. O oh Lord, may we hear you, may we trust you, and may we obey you. As we stand to worship, as we light our candles and ring our bell. Jeremiah 33, 14 to 16. The days are coming, declares the Lord, 
when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. Today we light the candle of hope. May it remind each and every one of us God's great promise to us. He is our hope, He is our Redeemer, and He is our Savior. Let us pray. God, who comes to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, during the Advent season may we be reminded of your promises to us and your fulfillment of them. Help us to prepare our lives for the coming of the Messiah. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
We continue in our time of worship for community prayer as we gather for praises and, and concerns and and just a variety of the things that is facing our, our body right now. So I invite uh, those, to, I do, I want to continue to remember uh, both Donna and Rick, uh, Rich as they continue to go through treatments for cancer, as they're fighting, and the family members who are also walking through this time with them. We just want to remember them for the strength and healing for them this day. Oh Lord, hear our prayers. And Rhonda? So, so Lord, we want to we want to remember today. Marianne's sister Emma Jean died a couple of days ago, and uh, we want to remember Marianne and her whole family during this time of grief. Lord, hear our prayers. And associated with that is my report. Uh, Marianne's brother Alonzo Brown is in a nursing home due to several falls. And Marianne's brother Alonzo is in a nursing home with a variety of health issues right now and concerns. So Lord, hear our prayers. Mike Walter requests prayers for Ernie and Dora. We want to continue to remember Ernie, who is in a variety of health issues right now during this time. We, it's hard because we can't connect with them, they're not with us, but we want to remember Ernie and Doris during this time. Lord, hear our prayers. We want to offer praises for uh, Bonnie and Norman's daughter, Lainey, who is feeling much better from, I believe, they con her and her family had contact COVID, but they're feeling better now each day. So, Lord, hear our praises. Heidi Stark, pray for finally being in our home. <laughs> so, Heidi and Tim and Mallory and Ben, they're finally moved in their, their home after a long, long ordeal. And so... I got to celebrate Thanksgiving and the Advent season. So, Lord, hear our praises. We want to continue to remember our college students. Some of them are at home. Some of them are still away uh, as they begin their, uh, their, their testing season and all the craziness that goes to it that during this time. And I also want to just celebrate all of you who participated in the care packages that went to them and for Pam who uh, helped in that, so let this be a praise. Lord, hear our praises. Others that I have missed, I know there's others. I want to continue to remember particularly our people in here during our church. The time of holidays is most beautiful, but it's most difficult for those who are grieving loss of life, particularly for our, uh, our parents like Philip and Penny who are still grieving the loss of their child, uh, Michael, spouses, family members, and friends. Uh, it's, just, it's just a difficult time. So I want us to continue to remember all of these during this season. As we celebrate, we also want to be to mourn with those who are mourning. So Lord, hear our prayers. I also would like us to continue to remember our nation. Uh, we've been through a difficult election season and it's still sorting itself out and there's just a lot of pain, a lot of grief, a lot of joy, just a lot of stuff. And so and it's all happening in the midst of all the things with COVID and just the normal day to day loss of life, loss of jobs. It's just a whole bunch of stuff that we're dealing with during this season. So Lord, hear our prayers. Lily, you have something you're thankful for? Your family. So we're just going to say Lily is thankful for her family. And I am too. Lord, hear our praises. All right, brothers and sisters, no matter what's going on, whatever storms are going on, the Lord is our center of, of peace, our center of harmony. So let's just go a little deeper as we pray. God, we join with the psalmist to declare, like a deer that thirsts for water, so our soul thirsts for you. 
Sometimes, God, we don't realize how thirsty we are for you until we stop and look around and we feel our body dehydrated, our very soul dehydrated. So we come in this season of Advent to ask to fill us up. Not because we deserve it or because we have the right stuff, no, because we're broken. In need of you. It's in your grace that we trust. Not in our abilities. It's not the right words we use. Or the right phrases we say. But it's in trust in your word. Oh Lord that declares that you're faithful. And that you hear the heart cries of your people. And we're crying oh God. It's a tough time right now. For we as Americans. We pray for peace, O oh God. In the political struggles and battles that are going on, we pray for peace. Your peace. Peace that, that includes truth and justice and all that good stuff that you died for, Jesus. We pray for healing and, and, and the ability to listen to one another. To be quick to listen but slow to speak, slow to anger. Father, forgive us as your children when we get so caught up in the political and cultural struggles of our time that we lose our identity. We forget that we belong to you, Jesus, first and everything else second. So Jesus, we gather around your table. We gather during this season of Advent to say, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Come, O come, Emmanuel. And fill us up with your spirit. Fill us up from the dehydration of this time. And may the expectation of you, Messiah, coming again, fill us with hope and joy. As we declare that prayer you taught us, Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
want to sit there. I'd say, or you can come down there too. That'd be great. Appreciate you. Appreciate your flexibility here today. So, children, today we're going to uh, talk a little bit about the characters of Christmas. And we're going to focus on one particular person. Now, we know in the Christmas story, in the Christmas season, we have Joseph and Mary and the angel and baby Jesus. And we have animals and a donkey. We have wise people, wise men. We have shepherds. We have all of that. And, another, and so part of their lives was what they gave. There was a lot of giving during this season. And I want to talk today about, and for the next few Sundays, about a person in church history. In church history. And I know, like, oh boy, church history. Boring. But church history is exciting. Because there's a lot of people, children, in church history whose lives are lives of giving to others. And one person is that I think this is what we look think this person looks like, but we're not certain. His name is Nicholas. And... Uh, Especially among our Catholic brothers and sisters, they like to refer to some people as saints. Now, in Scripture, we're all saints, but usually known as St. Nicholas, but we're just going to call him Nicholas today. And we think this is how he may look. We're not real certain. But one of the things about Nicholas that we're going to learn about, his life was about giving. He would give of his resources and of his time. He was born in the year 270, we think. And what year were you born in, Lily? 2011. This dude was born in 270, a long time ago. You know, that was like some 270 years after Jesus. So he's pretty close to that. And, and he is also known as a bishop. Now, in our Methodist church, we have bishops. And bishops' jobs were to oversee a whole bunch of churches and Christians. So he was also a bishop. So he had leadership. But he was a different kind of leader. He was a leader that spent time giving of his money and of his resources to people who needed it. And he was also known uh, uh, as, he had a nickname, and they called him the Miracle Worker. Because another thing that would occasionally happen in his life is that only was he giving, but every once in a while, just miraculous things would happen. In the same way that in the, the story of Advent and Christmas, there were a lot of miraculous, unusual things happen, a lot of things happened in Nicholas's life too. And so we're going to spend the next few Sundays looking at this person's life as we spend time remembering the stories of all the other Bible characters in history. But the thing that's most important we want to think about, he was about giving. Can you say giving? Yes. Of time, money, energy. And the whole Christmas story is about giving, about God who gave himself for all of us in the form of a little baby. I think that's pretty cool. So we're going to learn a little bit about Nicholas for the next few Sundays. We may even find out why there's apples on his uh, hand right there. You'll see there's some apples there. Okay? Well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this season where we celebrate you as a baby and all the people who loved you like Nicholas. Amen. Amen. Please join us for our offertory now. We are going to sing at verses 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6 of the King of Love on Shepherd Hill. <laughs> Thank you. 
we come to this time of giving and just want to remind everyone, uh, even though we are not gathered in our sanctuary, there are three different ways that you can continue to give of your tithes and offerings. You can mail them to the church. Another way is that you can go to our website. There is a place on our website where it says donate that you can actually donate online. There's going to be a, just a slight fee taken uh, out of that offering so that out of what you give online just for security purposes so that we use that service. Or if you'd like, if you're not comfortable with either of those, if you just want to meet me at the church at a certain time and I can receive those donations and get it to the, the finance committee people. So there's different ways that you can give during this time. And I appreciate your faithfulness during this time. We still have bills to pay and missions to support and things like that. So let us pray for that offering. Lord, thank you so much for what you've given us. Thank you now as you receive what we give back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks be to God. 
If you noticed, uh, as you've been listening to this live feed, if you're hearing any beeps or something, I forgot to turn off the sound on my phone. So, and reminders. So if you hear a little beep or beep, that's not your phone, that's the live feed. I forgot to turn it off, so I do apologize about that. Forgive me. Carol Porter, a former officer with the Phil Campbell Police Department, learned that his kidney was failing. Doctors prepared him for the reality of a seven to eight year wait, waiting period for a compatible donor. Potter said, we began praying about getting that right kidney. The family began reaching out to potential donors across the Southeast, but little could they know that the perfect match, the perfect match would be two miles away in the body of an unlikely prospect. On the other side of town, Jocelyn James was scrolling through Facebook when she saw the post about Potter's search. She remembers, I just threw my phone down and the Holy Spirit told me that right then that I had that man's kidney. James's willingness to be a donor was totally unexpected. In a recent interview, Officer Potter said, if you'd ask me 100 names of, of those who may give me a kidney, her name would have never come out to the list and been on top of the list. It's just unbelievable that she was willing to do that. You see, between 2007 and 2012, Jocelyn James was arrested 16 times for theft and drug charges, once even appearing on Franklin's Most Wanted, and on multiple occasions, Potter was the arresting officer. James, now clean for seven years, said, I was just living a really bad life, and I was really just a lost person. I was sick of living that life. She was tested and found out to be a perfect match, and she made the sacrifice that saved Potter's life. Citing her faith, James said, God restored me from the inside out. And to be able to give another human a kidney to extend his life is really important. Restoration, restoring, restoring a body, restoring a life, receiving a kidney, receiving a new start, restoration. That's the, the stuff of the season of Advent. And as we come to this season of Advent, we may find ourselves joining with the psalmist this day. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. So this is the stuff of Advent. The calling out to God of restoring, renewing. Come, help us, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Three times in our psalm today, the psalmist declares to God, Restore us, O God. Let your face shine so that we may be saved. And that salvation, that asking for saving, it wasn't just spiritual. It was the totality. It was saving from exile. It was saving from harm, from issues of, 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 of lack of prosperity. And it was spiritual. It was everything. When the Hebrews cried out for salvation, they were not just asking for saving of their soul, but they were saving of every aspect of their life. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. I have a feeling during this particular Advent 2020, even saying 2020 now carries that sense of, uh, that sense of what's going to happen next. Maybe a lot of us are still waiting for Godzilla to show up, aren't we? What worse can happen in 2020? And yet, the context of 2020 is an absolute great foundation. Because in many sense, it represents the worst of worse. And maybe in that sense, Advent may make more sense to us. 
it may actually make a lot more sense because we find out that it's not about going to Walmart and getting the best deal. And it's not even about celebrating the tradition. No, Advent is about, oh God, help us. We have goofed. We have messed it up. We are off kilter. We have fallen off our horses. The water's not working. The trees are falling down. We need you now. Restore us, O oh God. Let your face shine. But it's important to know that the psalmists were crying out to a particular God. And they had a particular understanding of who this God was. And, in, and so Psalm 80 opens up with this interesting description of this God. The word shepherd is used and the idea of being a throne. So this God that the psalmist is crying out is first referred to as a shepherd. And for the people of that time, they understood the job, the role of a shepherd. It was to care for the sheep, to take care of the sheep, to nurture the sheep, to watch out for the sheep, to make sure they didn't go astray, to help in the birthing process, and all that other stuff that went with that. But there's something we need to hear, we who are called sheep. And this is kind of important, especially here for American Christians. Sheep were not just a group of people that sit around and say, hey, I'm a sheep. No, sheep had a purpose. In the Hebrew world. They had a purpose. They had a function. They were either used to provide clothing to people. Or they were slaughtered to provide food for people. Or they were used as part of a worship service in God. For God. In other words, sheep in and of themselves could not just sit around and say, hey, I'm a chosen one. I'm better than you. No, sheep had a purpose for all creation. Their very lives had purpose. And so a shepherd was protecting them not so that they could just sit and drink Pepsi all day. Or well, uh, well, water, whatever sheep drink, sorry. <laughs> they were not there just to hang out and eat grass. The shepherd was protecting them so that they could fulfill their purpose. They were protected from the wolves and the lions and from all that, so that they could be about the work that God had called them to, which was to be food, clothing, and resources for worship. But also in that Psalms, it talks about how God, the great shepherd, is enthroned. Since I don't have people out in the audience, I'll say it to the people here. Everyone say enthroned. enthroned. And that image is that they're enthroned on the cherubims. Now, this comes from the image of the Ark of the Covenant, the two cherubims, the two angels, the two, excuse me, two cherubim creatures. They're the ones that have wings, and their wings are stretched across the top of the top of the, the Ark of the Covenant. And, the, and in Hebrew thought that God actually rested on top of those cherubims. And that the Ark of the Covenant was the footstool by which God's feet came down. So his throne was in heaven, the unseen realm. His feet rested upon the cherubims. He was enthroned. So what we have is the psalmist saying to the shepherd king, help us, God, help us. You who is, who is our shepherd and our king. The shepherd king. During this season of Advent, our theme is meeting the king. But the king that we're about to meet is also a shepherd. He's not just a king who's going to use his position, power, and privilege to do his thing. He is a king who is here with a special purpose to take care of his sheep so that the sheep can do their purpose. Well, though, there was a problem. A big problem. The sheep of the shepherd and the citizens of the kingdom were not doing their purpose. In fact, they were going opposite of what the shepherd king was wanting. And the people of Israel were violating the covenant, participating in injustice and idolatry. And so the psalmist begins to describe a scene that the relationship between God and humanity was all 
messed up. And he utilizes images that we who, as, who have relations with one another will understand. One aspect is that of anger. The psalmist recognizes that God's not happy. Now, when we hear that, that God gets angry, we automatically think about the bad examples of anger. Okay? And we assume and we project upon this God how we humans get angry. Well, we humans have biological chemicals in our systems. That's not God. Anger on God's part was very much an anger against the injustice and sin that was occurring. Mm -hmm. Now, we who are human, we understand anger. When there's a breakdown in a relationship, we get angry because anger is telling us something's not right with this relationship. When we get angry, we're declaring something's not right here, and my emotions are telling me that, even if I can't comprehend it. Now, I know that none of you in your relationships with spouses or friends get angry. I do get angry, though. And I have to learn to somehow mediate that anger. But many times, if I look back on my anger, it's because I feel that I've been wronged or there's something wrong in the relationship. That's what the anger we're talking about here. The kind of anger that the psalmist understands on the part of God, that the relationship is not in sync. And that it's causing a sense of lostness and disconnect between the people of God and God himself. Another image that is used to describe the breakdown is the idea of tears. He even says that your, my tears are my bread because he's feeling, he's experiencing as, as a representative of God's people the breakdown in relationship. He says all day long I eat, my bread is my tears, my tears are my bread. Now what an image. Tears tell us something is up inside us. When a tear comes out of our body, it's telling us, hey, body, something's going on inside you. Pay attention to me. Something's not right. And it either can be something's not right or something's unusual or something's wonderful, but tears express something deep inside. And in this setting, the psalmist is declaring, God, this breakdown in relationship between you and I between you and your people is causing a lot of angst. I'm going to ask you a question. During this season of 2020, are you guys feeling some angst? I am. I feel a lot of angst. Maybe some of you have been pride. Maybe some of you have been angry. Maybe some of you got on Facebook and like, I cannot believe that happened. What do you mean? Felt some anger? Anger and tears could be a sign that something is disrupted in relationships. And for followers of Jesus, it could mean also something is disrupted in our relationship with God. So we find ourselves singing of Advent, crying out, Restore us, O God. Restore us, O oh God. Let your face shine so that we may be saved. That we may be saved. Another image that is used in this Psalms that is really unique, and it's, it's, it's very creative. I love how the psalmist do this. It talks about how there was a vine in Egypt. And so the psalmist begins to describe the history of God's people starting with Egypt. And it talks about how God went to Egypt and took the vine out of Egypt. And then he came to the promised land and he cleared the ground. Like anyone would clear ground for, for planting. And he took that vine and he planted it into the ground. And then the, the vines begin to grow and produce life. And then what God did is put a wall around the vineyard. To keep out the wild creatures who would come and feast on the plants. So what you have here is this interesting image of us being sheep 
but also vine. But both sheep and vine have a purpose. They provide nourishment to the world. The psalmist says, because of the breakdown in relationship, the walls have been broken down. The boundaries have been violated. And now wild boars, pigs, the unclean, are trampling into the vineyard. vineyard. Pretty desolate, isn't it? And it's in the midst of that that there's a longing for the shepherd king to come. A longing of restoration, of renewal, of life. A longing. There's a verse that the psalmist used. He says, Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted. To the psalmist has no doubt about his, their relationship with God. They knew they were special. They had been planted by the right hand of God, the special hand, that the, 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 the royal part of the hand. But they recognize that they have good. And you'll notice in this psalm that it's God who's angry. God's doing all this stuff. And we have a tendency of doing that. Sometimes when we mess up, we blame somebody else. Maybe y'all don't do what I do, okay? It's always someone else's fault. You know, it's your fault or my, that person's fault or they, the infamous they. Or it's the government's fault or it's the church's fault. Or it's your fault, my husband, my husband or your fault, my wife. We're always blaming someone else. And so the psalmist says, God, you're doing all this. But in the season of Advent, it's an opportunity to stop and look at ourselves and realize our part in the favor of the relationship. Because in any relationship that breaks down, whatever minor or major part we have in it, we contribute to the breakdown in the relationship. So the psalmist is realizing, God, we goofed. <laughs> we messed up. See, the season of Advent is not about another holiday. It is an opportunity to start the Christian counter over with an understanding that we all long for something that we don't have. Something better. So we cry out, O come, O come, Emmanuel. But I want everyone to hear this. This is what's unique. That in belonging, there's a declaration of faith because you wouldn't ask of somebody something unless you really believe they're going to give it to you. They assumed that God would restore. Because the Hebrew people knew about this God. Oh, yes, this God could get angry. This God could get frustrated. But this was the God of mercy and grace. This was the God that heard the cries of his people, even when his people contributed to the breakdown of relationship. And so we come. There we go. In this season of Advent, so what do you feel like? You feel like a sheep or a bud? <laughs> do you feel like a lonely sheep that's out there and you're lost, you're not knowing what to do? You goofed, you got lost, you blamed everyone else, but now you realize you're all alone. <laughs> Is that what you feel right now? Or are you like that, that, that little plant, little bud, out in the middle of nowhere. And you're alive, 
But you feel so alone. Whatever you feel, Advent's for you. And you. And you. And me. Because whatever 2020 is thrown at us, we're God's people. And we take time to anticipate and contemplate in this season, to get away from the news cycles and the craziness and just come before God and just say, oh God, I need you. I need you. Restore us. Hear our prayers. O come, O come, Emmanuel. O come, Shepherd King, and save us in the year 2020. Let us declare our hymn of dedication today. Thank you.